Amen. Boy, it fits what we're going to be talking about today because we're talking about a lively hope. Man, what greater hope than we have than what we have in the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Today, we want to continue on our quest through um, 1 Peter. But I'm, I've finished up who we are. We've been talking about who we are in Jesus Christ. And we want to take it to the next um, question, and it's what have we been given? We know who we are in Christ, but in 1 Peter, we also find some incredible things that God gives us as those who know him as our Lord and Savior. And in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3 through 5, we find this. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again, listen to this, unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. As I said in previous weeks, we was talking about who we are in Jesus Christ. And today we want to talk about what we've been given. Now, Keep in mind, because of who we are, God has given us some spectacular, some incredible gifts. There are some things that God has given us that are of such value that it's just unimaginable at what he has given us. And when we look at those gifts, those outlooks, those promises that God has given us, what we find is that they are all ours through what he calls a lively hope. That is a hope that is alive, a hope that's not dead, a hope that has no future, a hope that is careless and reckless. This is an absolute hope that is already alive. This is a hope that is founded in what Jesus Christ has accomplished on the cross of Calvary, having died, but then resurrected from the grave, a hope that we have found in the evidence of Jesus Christ. That's what we have. You know, there seems to be in our society too few things, or in our world, I guess I should say, too few things that um, create what we would call a genuine hope in our life. I mean, let's think about our society. Is there anything in the economy that brings hope? Is there anything in our political system that we can say brings hope? Is there anything in our national security that brings hope? Is there anything in the job market that brings hope? How about just in the integrity of people across the world that brings hope? How about in our educational system? In fact, we live in a society or in a world that is, in all honesty, a very hopeless society. Oh, we see moments of hope. We see moments where it looks like things are on the upswing. There are times where you think, oh, well, you know what? It looks like things might get better. But the fact is, there is nothing that we have such a firm foundation in that we can say it's going to get better and stay better forever. It's not going to happen. There is always a concern that when it gets better, we've got to keep it better or it's going to fall again. There is no hope. Nothing in our society that brings that kind of hope. There is only the foundation of Jesus Christ that gives us that kind of a hope. In fact, a lot of times when I preach, um, I preach from the 23rd Psalm, and, and in the beginning of the 23rd Psalm, says, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. And I think about that, and I think about lying down in a green pasture, and what I find in that is the safety, the security, a place where we can lie down and feel completely comfortable, knowing that everything is secure. What God is saying is, listen, in that green pasture, I am that green pasture, and I'll provide for you a foundation that is steadfast, that is firm, and that will always be there. Man, we can lie down knowing that that foundation will never crumble, and for all eternity, we have a foundation that is sure. You know, even in our society, I, I, I want to I I share a very sobering thought with you for just a moment. Look at the people sitting around you. Look at the person you love, the people sitting next to you, the, the people you care for, your friends, your family. And think for just a moment. There's nobody here that is so naive that we, we think that death isn't going to come. We, we get it. Death's coming. 
It's imminent. We get it. We're all going to die. We know that. Either we're going to die or the Lord's going to come and take us home. Something's going to happen. But yet, every one of us here probably think the person sitting next to us is going to be there tomorrow. There's an assumption that's made. We assume that tomorrow we're going to wake up and they're going to be right there with us. Just a phone call away or maybe just in the same household. Whatever the case may be, we expect them to be there tomorrow. And we live our life based on that assumption. But there is a reality that that might not be true. The reality is anything can happen. We could die today. Somebody here could have a heart attack. We could have an accident heading home. A lot of different things can happen. And that person you love, that person you care for, that person you expect to be right there beside you tomorrow might not be there. You don't have that promise. It's because the foundation in this world is not sure. There is nothing in this world that is sure. Your foundations are not sure. The generation before me thought the job market was secure. They thought they could move up here from, I don't know, Tennessee, Kentucky, move into Ohio or Michigan, find a job at Fisher Body or a GM plant or somewhere like that, and they were secure for life, and that job would never go away, and they knew that they had a good job, a good retirement, and nothing was going to, going to hinder that. But you and I both know that's, that's not the case any longer. That's gone. It's gone by the wayside. Those jobs, those securities are long gone. In my generation, I, I thought about the fact that, listen, in my generation, we were taught there was nobody as great as the United States of America. Man, nobody would come to war against us. We were the toughest, the strongest. We had more, uh, we had, uh, more um, what would you call it, tanks and our, our armament than anybody else in all the world. Nobody could come against us. We were it. And then 9-11 kind of shook that foundation. And I realized that's just not so. Nothing in this world has a foundation that's sure. And all God is saying is this. Listen, the foundation that we have in him, in the resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, gives us a hope that is a hope that is alive. It is not dead. It's not unsure. It is a hope that is alive, and it is sure in what God has given us in this precious book. So that's what we have. So the only real hope we can find today is a hope we find in Jesus Christ. And it's a hope that extends even beyond this lifetime and extends right into eternity. It's a hope that is built upon real promises, real commitments, real love, and a very real ability to accomplish everything that God says he'll accomplish. It's a hope that's on a firm foundation. We are told that the greatest gifts today in Scripture, we're told that the greatest gifts are three. And it's faith, hope, and charity. Charity is love in action. I know a lot of people just substitute the word love, but it actually takes you beyond the word love. So we have faith, hope, and charity. Now, in Scripture, Paul does this incredible job of challenging us to exercise his, our, our faith so that we can have a better relationship with God and others. And, and while John is a master at displaying that idea of love, he was the one that was the beloved, uh, the beloved follower of Jesus Christ, lay on Jesus' breast, and, and he was the one that displays that true love. It's in, the, it's in the book of John, man, we see that word love used over and over and over again. You know, we see the love of Jesus Christ in John 3, 16. We understand what love is. But we find in Peter's epistle here, we find a declaration of hope. So Paul emphasizes the faith. John emphasizes the love. But Peter really hammers home that hope. I mean, we have hope in a resurrected Jesus. Man, what hope that we have. You know, there are going to be some who are raptured out, and there are going to be others who are taken from the graves. But there is going to be this point in time where Jesus Christ is going to return. And when he does, I'm going to tell you now, death cannot, will not hold us. He's just going to call us out. You know, when we deal with those three things that I just spoke about, faith, hope, and charity, I, I want to give you just a real fast little lesson on that just for the fun of it because they each deal with a different relationship. Our faith deals with our relationship with God. We are saved 
by faith. By faith, we trust and believe his word to be true, his salvation to be true. Therefore, we believe that Jesus to be, Jesus to be our only source of salvation. He is our only hope. Sent from God, we know he is God. We know he died, was buried, and resurrected by faith. I believe that. And in that faith, I secure a relationship with God. Then he talks, let's, let's jump to charity. In charity, we find this. And as I said before, charity is a love in action. It is in this charity that we find our relationship with others. We find that with that same love and that showing of that love, we build and form a relationship with God's children. He tells us that we have to love each other if we love God. We, we can't love God if we don't love each other. And we won't love each other if we don't love God. God, God says it works that way. There is, a, there is something that is a, a, there's a working force with that love that we understand that, listen, we have a responsibility to love each other. I have a responsibility to love you. I have a responsibility to be kind to you. I have a responsibility to treat you the way you ought to be treated. But by the same token, if I don't treat you that way, you still have a responsibility to love me just as I am, be forgiving and caring. You know what? My love should should not be conditional upon what you do, what you say, how you act. My love ought to be unconditional because it's a part of who God called us to be. We are to have faith and we are to have charity, a love in action. I display that love, ought to display that love. But then we look at the hope. We say, okay, then the faith has to do with the relationship I have between God and, uh, with God and the love more so with others what about, the, what, about the, what about the hope? This is what God gave, it, gave to us for us. It's so that in my understanding, I can look to the facts that God has given me about Jesus Christ resurrecting from the grave. I can look at the evidence that's been provided. I can always look to his book and find comfort in his word. And I can find hope in his word. It's something that helps me have the relationship that I need to have so that I can be confident, so that I can do what God's called me to do, so that I can know that, listen, God has got something for me that is so incredible. So my faith is built on a relationship with God, my love, a relationship with you. But my hope is because I sometimes need something that gives me the confidence, the courage, the boldness to know that, listen, it's for me. I'm going to, I'm going to throw a movie line at you for just a moment. You can figure out the movie, but the movie line is what's in it for me. What's in it for me? Hope. It's the hope. It's what God has in store for me. It's the understanding and the knowing that, listen, God is going to come and claim me out of the grave or he's going to just rapture me out. It's the understanding and knowing that God has already built a house for me. It's the understanding and knowing that I have a home in heaven, that I have that relationship with Jesus Christ. It's the hope and looking to a, a God who has loved me enough that I can look back over the annals of time. I can see all the history of what has taken place, and I can see where it's all built up to one single moment where Jesus Christ returns and calls me home. And I think about that, and I think, man, what lively hope. A hope built on facts, a hope built on a foundation, a hope that isn't just hearsay, but a hope that rests in Jesus Christ. He calls it that blessed hope, that lively hope. So let's take a look at it. Let's kind of break it down and kind of see some things about this hope that makes it so incredible and makes it so wonderful. Number one, our lively hope is to conquer the grave I want you to think about the, the worst enemy today we talk about well my worst enemy is Satan truth be known you probably think about dying more than you think about is Satan attacking today you know we think about people we love and then the fact that they may die we we get you know uh, some kind of doctor's report back and we think well my days are numbered and we start looking at those things and we realize death is imminent and quite honestly most of us probably are more concerned about death than anything else. And so what we find is this, is we can and we will conquer the grave 
through Jesus Christ. Now, I want you to look at the source of that. When I just say it, I mean, I can just say it, and it doesn't really mean anything. I don't know if you realize that or not, but most of what we say doesn't mean anything because it's not really founded in God's Word. Um, it's kind of interesting because when you do a funeral, for example, or let's say someone loves you, that you loved rather died or passed on, and you're standing at the casket, people are coming around, and they tell you things. They say, well, everything's going to be okay. Oh, they're at a better place. And, and, and here's a simple fact. They don't know that. And you know what? They can't determine that. Now, I get that they're words of comfort, and, and I've probably said silly things like that myself. But the fact is, we can't promise that. When God says, let not your heart be troubled, he has the ability to let not your heart be troubled. But when I say it, I don't have the ability to make that happen. So what happens is, is I sometimes will say things that, quite frankly, might not be true. I'm just trying to comfort you. And we're all kind of guilty of that. So what we look at here is this. We see that it makes a difference as to who said it. If I say those things, it makes no difference. But if God says it, now it means something. If God says, listen, this is, is what's in store for you that believe me. This is what I have in store for you. This is what your eternity is. When I read it in God's book and as I, I look at this book, I know this is truth. I mean, there are, this is, it's a hard thing today to determine what's true and what's not, isn't it? I mean, I believe this Bible to be completely and totally accurate. I believe it to be totally true. There is a lost word out, world out there. I don't care if they're scientists. I don't care if they're professors. I don't care who they are. But there is a lost world out there that will deny that this book is true. And they want to tell you all that they can tell you that's contrary to this book. I'm here to tell you that it doesn't matter how smart they think they are. Our God is smarter. Amen. If I want the information, I don't want it from somebody that's looking at history and trying to figure it out. I want it from the source, and the source is God himself. If God created it, only God can give me accurate information about it. That's his word. So my lively hope rests in the source of the fact that God said it. He says in our text, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope. So if our hope, if, if our hope is in man and what man has to say, I'm going to tell you now it's severely lacking. Man changes his mind too much. Growing up, you know, there were times where evolution was taught and then it changed, and then it changed, and then it changed. There's a reason why they call it a theory. And the reason it's called a theory is because they don't have facts. So when we look at this picture, here's what we understand. We understand that the source needs to be a source that can only give us the facts and the truth, that source being God. So if my hope is in anything that man has to say, it doesn't mean much. You know, I've heard people say that if you want something to fail, get the government involved. <laughs> well, ain't that the truth? If you want salvation to fail, get man involved. Get man involved. Nothing is going to destroy hope like depending upon something that sinful man has to say. Folks, I got news for you. If I tell you something, it means deadly squat unless it's directly from what God has to say. Because my word means nothing unless it's based on God's word. Pope John Paul II, going back a few years, and one of his general audiences said regarding the dead, um, and he referred to them as being in purgatory. And here's what he said. This is a direct quote. If you want the uh, website, I can give it to you. They depend entirely on the prayers of the living. Folks, I love you, just so you know. I would do anything I can to help you. I pray for you. But if my salvation is based on your prayers, I'm going to die and go to hell. <laughs> Simple as that. We need to understand and know that, listen, our salvation is not based on man or anything man does or anything man says. It's based solely on what Jesus Christ has done for us. 
And we need to know that without a shadow of a doubt. If my salvation is based on men, I am miserably, miserably damned and doomed unto an eternal hell. God has given us a hope like none other. He tells us this in 1 Peter 1.21, who by him do believe in God that raised him up from the dead and gave him glory that your faith and hope might be in God. You know, the fact of Jesus' resurrection is evidence that my hope is not in vain. The fact that Jesus is not in the grave anymore. The fact that he resurrected from the grave. The fact that he conquered death. I'm going to read this passage just because I love this passage. I wasn't going to read it, but, but I've got it in my notes, so I'm going to go ahead and read it. He says this, 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18. For a saved individual, I'm just going to tell you, I read this at the graveside of almost every one of them that I do if they know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Paul tells the church of Thessalonica this because the church of Thessalonica was concerned about something. They were concerned about the fact that what happens with saved individuals when they die? What happens? Here's what happens. I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not even as others which have no hope. For if you believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Man, I got to tell you, those words are pretty comforting. When I think about that, I have folks that I know that I love that I'm looking forward to seeing again. And I'm telling you now, I know they'll be raised up out of the graves. You know, wouldn't it be an exciting thing to let that happen at just the moment you decided to visit them, put flowers on the grave? And there you are, and all of a sudden the Lord returns, and here they come, phew, right up out of the grave. We have, we have like, like uh, I would imagine most families have this, but we have like a little family plot, you know, where we've bought extra graves, and we got all, we're, we're over here in Arlington Cemetery, and so we have a lot of family in that very same little area. I'm just here to tell you, I would love to be there someday and just be there praying or thinking or doing whatever I do when I visit. And my dad, my son, my brother-in-law, my sister-in-law, my nephew, all come rolling up out of that grave. Just come rolling up out of there. Look at me and say, Barry, catch up. <laughs> catch up. We're heading out before you, but you catch up. <laughs> Wouldn't that be a great sight? This is our hope. You see, this is the lively hope. And I believe that because the source that has given me that information is God himself. God, who is, who is the God of the living. The God who, who uh, we see created all things from nothing. He is the God of the living. He brought life. He breathed life into man. It is the same God that will call us up out of the graves. We'll be reunited with this old body. And it doesn't matter. The funniest to me is there are some that maybe during the dark ages when they didn't want the Christianity to, to really kind of spread and they would, they would actually cut people in pieces and scatter them all over the world. There are those who have been cast into the sea. There are those who have been cremated. And we look at all of these and we think, God, how are you going to do this? And God said, I made them. What makes you think I can't? And he'll gather them up all together. And they'll come in, unto him, receive their new body, and forevermore live with him. What a hope! Because God has given us the facts. I want you to look at the assurance of this hope. Who are kept, he tells us in verse 5 of chapter 1 of 1 Peter, who are kept by the power of God. What am I dependent upon? Number one, I'm dependent upon a God that exists. 
a God who brought all things into existence. But secondly, I'm kept by his power. Not my power. Oh, if it was kept by my power, I'm going to tell you I'd be lost tomorrow. If it was kept by my power, man, I'm going to slip up. I'm going to mess up. I'm going to fall on my face. If it's kept by my doing, I'm in, I'm in real trouble. My hope is based on the fact that I am kept in God's power. It is by his hands. It is by what he has accomplished. It is by the fact that he is God and that he can do as he pleases. I'm kept by his power. Was that a big deal? I don't know. You decide. He brought everything that exists into existence. We don't even know what everything is. We can't even reach to the ends of the universe. We can't even reach to the core of this earth. We can't even imagine the complexity of a human life. It is by this power that we are kept. God who created all of this. We are kept by that power. Oh, that poor lost person. That poor lost person who believes that somewhere in the annals of time that there was this big bang. And, and, and I don't know what the big bang came from because at some point in time somebody should have created something that it started with. But the big bang that came from nothing and created everything and the complexity just by chance and the complexity of who we are. Seriously. I'd rather choose but God. God. In his power, we are kept. There is an assurance. I mean, think about just Jesus in, in, in Scripture. Just, just look at some of the things he did there. Whether it be calming the storms, made, uh, made the wine into water, uh, compounded the bread and the fish. He just bypassed everything it would take to do all of that. Do you know that? You know, when you talk about just think for this, about this for a moment. When he turned water into wine, you ever stop to think about just what took place there? I mean, he took water and, and bypassed planting the grapes. He bypassed waiting for the grapes to grow. He bypassed harvesting those grapes. He bypassed having to take them and do all the process that you would need to do to turn them into juice. He bypassed it all. And he just turned the water into wine. This is the power of God. He just bypassed all. How about his power over Satan and his devils? I mean, we see time and time again where he cast devils out of men, out of women. How about his power over disease? He healed the blind, the paraplegic, the lame, the dumb. You name it, he healed it. He has power over death, hell, and the grave. So, well, when did he do that? Well, he did it with Lazarus, for one. I could give you several others in Scripture if you like, but more importantly, he did it himself. He died. By the way, Jesus did, in fact, die. That's the penalty of our sins. He paid the penalty. He died. And he resurrected from the grave. And we are kept by this wondrous power. John 10, 28 says this, and I give unto them eternal life and they shall never perish. Listen to that. They shall what? Never? Is that what it says? Never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. I'm kept by his power. Not by my power. Not by anything I could do or have done. I am kept by his power. The wondrous blood of Jesus Christ is as good today as it has always been. It'll keep me for all eternity. Now, the proof that gives us this hope. He talks about the hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Now, I don't need witnesses here on earth to confirm that. I have God's word. That's sufficient. But he gives it to us just the same just so that we kind of get a grip on this, so that we understand that, listen, I didn't do this in some dark closet. This was public. 
and people knew. He was seen of the 12 that followed him on lots of different occasions. He was seen by two guys on the Emmaus Road. He was seen in the garden by all those ladies that came and visited the tomb. He was seen by more than 500 people at one time. I love the explanation for that. Those who want to deny that, they don't deny that the people say they saw him, but they say this, they were swooned because they were standing out in the heat of the sun. 500 people standing out in the heat of the sun swooned and somehow saw something they didn't really see. All 500 of them. I choose to believe what God says. This thing was not done, like I said, in some dark corner. It wasn't kept secret from the people. His resurrection was very public, and his return, by the way, will be very public. I love that picture. I want you to think about this on the account of Jesus' resurrection. Matthew 27 says this, And the graves were opened. Many bodies of the saints which slept arose and came out of the graves after his resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared unto many. Man, how would that have been? How, how cool would that have been? Jesus Christ himself dies on the cross of Calvary and resurrects, and after he resurrects, all of these other people that had already died, probably Old Testament saints, had died, raise up, rise up from the grave and walk around and say, let's go into Jerusalem and kind of freak some people out. <laughs> and so they go into the city, and they're like, well, I thought you were dead. I was, but I'm alive. Folks, we have a lively hope. Paul, when he was speaking to King Agrippa, says this about Jesus and his resurrection. He says in Acts 26, 26, For the king knoweth of these things, before whom also I speak freely. He says, listen, I'm not telling you anything you haven't already heard. All right? For I am persuaded that none of these are hidden from him. Listen to this. For this thing was not done in a corner. God didn't just do this thing off here on the side and then tell everybody it was done. Oh, this is public. He did it in a way everybody could know. Everybody that wanted to see him die on the cross could see him die on the cross. Everyone that wanted to see could see him put into the, into the grave, into the sepulcher. Anybody and everybody that wanted to see could go by and, and understand and know that sepulcher was empty. He made a point of making sure that anybody and everybody could see what had taken place. It was public knowledge. Jesus Christ arose. Peter, when writing this, is not writing, by the way, about hearsay. He is not writing about rumors he has heard. Peter was an eyewitness. And he's saying, this is my eyewitness account. I saw him die. I saw him buried. And I saw him after he resurrected. He viewed the empty tomb. He was in the upper room when Christ appeared and challenged them. Touch me, feel me. He had a very personal and a very private encounter with Jesus. Again, he appeared at when Peter was present in the upper room. He was fishing on the Sea of Galilee, and Jesus appears unto him again. He was present on the Mount of Olives when Jesus decides to take his final leave and said, I'll not be back, and I'm going to send you a comforter. Understand and know, be sure, our hope is not some type of wishful thinking. It is founded upon truth. It's actively and dynamically alive. Our hope is that death is not going to hold us. And that hope is founded in Jesus Christ. Our hope is alive too in the fact that our lively hope is to enter into glory. Not only can death not hold us, but it can't keep us from what God has prepared for us. I'm looking forward to that. Let me just run through this. The guarantee, here's the guarantee of our hope, to an inheritance, incorruptible, undefiled, that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you. What a promise. What a promise. So my hope is not just, not just that, that death is not going to hold me, but that God has something prepared for me that is so incredible that I can't even imagine it. Jesus clearly told us that I go to prepare a place for you. And what a promise. Our promise is sealed, he says, by the Holy Spirit in Ephesians 4.30. Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed until the day of redemption. Sealed. God said, I've got something for you. 
and it's yours. Nobody's going to take it away from you. It's yours. You know, I, I love the words that are used here to describe it. He tells us that it's incorruptible. So the first thing we find is it's not affected by the laws of thermodynamics. There's no rust, no corruption whatsoever. There's nothing that's going to happen to it. It's sure it's always going to be there. All right? It's not going to rust, erode, decay, rot, be corrupted in any way whatsoever. You know, we've seen great monuments. We've seen great houses and memorials of all sorts that are no longer even in existence. Just by natural causes, they're gone. So that's not going to happen, can't happen, can't be destroyed. It says it's undefiled. That means our inheritance cannot be defiled by sin, by any man, by corrupt politicians, by evil rulers, by false religious leaders, any kind of apostasy whatsoever. He's saying it's pure and clean and untouched by anything but God. In fact, I'm going to read for you a passage here in just a moment. But in that passage, we read that we have a house not made with hands. There's nothing that will defile it. He says also that it fadeth not away. Our inheritance cannot be outdated, can't be sun bleached, can't lose its effectiveness. It can't just simply fade away into oblivion. You've had those old photos, haven't you, where, you know, some of the really old ones that you're trying to see who they are and they've faded so much. It's like, I can't really even tell who that is. You know, I say, that's not going to happen. It's not going to fade away. It's always going to be there. And, and, and what God has given us is always going to be fresh. And it's always going to be new. You know, the reservation of our hope is cool too. What do you mean the reservation? Me, I've got a reservation? He says it's reserved in heaven for you. That sounds like a reservation to me. It does. And by the way, that reservation costs too. We was just talking the other day about prices of uh, hotel rooms. You know, it's like, man, you believe how, like everything else, I guess, how the prices have went up. It's hard to even stay anywhere anymore. Well, I'm going to tell you, they'll never reach the price of this reservation. The price of this reservation is what Jesus Christ paid on the cross of Calvary. He paid for this. It's reserved for me in heaven. And you know what? I haven't paid a dime for it. I don't deserve it. But God loved me and by his grace provided it for me. Reserved for me. I want you to look at this reservation. I'm going to read a pretty lengthy passage and I'm going to be done. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1 through 8. For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God and house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan, earnestly desired to be clothed upon with our house which is from heaven if so that being clothed we shall not be found naked for we that are in this tabernacle do groan being burdened not for that we would be unclothed but clothed upon that mortality might be swallowed up in life now he hath wrought us for the self same thing as God who also hath given unto us the earnest of the spirit I love that word earnest by the way if you've ever bought a house you remember you had to put down earnest money what that money was was just a guarantee that you're going to buy the house. What God has given us as a guarantee of our home that's in heaven is the Holy Spirit of God that we are sealed, by the way, with until the day of redemption. Therefore, we are always confident, knowing that whilst we're at home in the body, we're absent from the Lord. Verse 7, you guys know this verse? Man, write it down, write it down, write it down on your heart. For we walk by faith, not by sight. We walk by faith, not by sight. I'm going to tell you now, every funeral you ever go to that have the body displayed, there is a deception that goes on. The deception is we look at that casket and we say, oh, there's the person that we came to see, whoever they might be. There they are. No, they're not. That's the house they used to live in. That's the home they used to have. Whether they're saved, whether they're lost, neither here nor there, that's where they used to live. That's the house they lived in when they were on this earth. That's the house that if we know Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, that's the house that's going to be changed. And it's going to become immortal. It's going to become everything God said it would become. But in the time being, it's going to lie in the grave until you go back into the home. But that's the old house. By sight, we can be deceived. Now, that's what we remember about the person because that's the only home we remember. 
I've taken my grandkids at, at one time or another, some of them, and I've taken them to where my grandma and grandpa used to live, and, and I'll drive down that old road, and I'll say, that's where grandma and grandpa used to live. There's the old house we used to, I mean, the old, um, the old barn we used to play in. There's where, the, you know, the chicken coop. There's the outhouse. There's, and, and those woods back there we play. Yeah, I can go through all those things, but you know what I can't do? I can never say, oh, by the way, there's grandma and grandpa. You know why? Because they're not there. It's the place where all my memories are, but it's where they used to live. They don't live there anymore. We can be deceived. They don't live there anymore. Because we walk by faith, believing and trusting Jesus Christ, believing and trusting God at his word, believing and knowing that our only hope is in him. We are confident, I say, and willing, rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. I look forward to that day. I'm going to be honest with you. I'm like the rest of you. There's, There's things in this earth, and it's because it's all I know. That's all I know. I've never seen heaven. This earth's what I know. This is where the people I love and care for are. This is where everything I know exists. And so it, it's hard to imagine leaving this, even though we know we will. But I also look forward to what heaven must be like, to what my Lord and Savior must be like. You know, I can imagine a lot of things, but I don't think even my imagination can even remotely come close to what it must be like. We have a lively hope in him. Now, here's my question for you. Do you have that lively hope? Do you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, everything I've preached today is for somebody else, not you. Unless you trust him unless you welcome him into your life, unless you ask him to be your savior, unless you have faith enough to believe that he died for your sins and that he arose from the dead and is preparing that place for you. That's a lively hope. Without Jesus Christ in the mix, you have no hope. He is your only hope. Bow your heads with me if you would. Today, examine your life. And can you honestly say you have that hope? Can you look at your life today and say, you know what? I know Jesus Christ is my Savior. I trust him. And I'm looking forward to that day. That's why he says there's no fear in death. Man, it just sucks all the fear right out of it. Because we know and believe what God has promised to be true. Dear Father, I pray that today you work and move in our lives. If there is anyone here today, Lord, who has not trusted you as their Savior, I pray, Father, they'll not delay. They'll trust you even now. And, Lord God, that they'll be willing to make it public knowledge. It's not done in a corner. Make it public knowledge so that other folks can be encouraged by it and can rejoice in it. Father, today I pray we'll make the decisions you would have us to make. Lord, we love you. We trust you. Today, Lord, work and move in our lives in such a way that we see this lively hope that you've given us. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Brother Luke.